Okay, so first off, we're in Photoshop, and I've got two photos here that we're going to talk about a little bit later, and I'm resizing and reshaping them because I want to get the profile and the front image to align as perfectly as I can. Photography can bend and distort things. This is a clay model, so it won't be symmetrical. However, we're going to fix that as well. Once the photos are aligned, I'm cropping them to save them out as separate images. As we jump into Moai 3D, you see that I select under view the image icon that brings up a dialog box that allows me to add images. Once I select that image, I am free to place it inside of Moai and this will become our reference that we will build from. Select add image again and from the side view, I'm going to insert the profile view of Iron Man. Now, if I click on the image again, you see I can select one of the images I've imported and click the align button. That allows me in 3D to move that image around. I'm going to center it about the origin so we can be perfectly symmetrical. Speaking of perfectly symmetrical, I'm mirroring the right side onto the left and I'm going to mirror the left side onto the right. By doing this, I create two different options. They're both slightly different and I'm comparing them, flipping them back and forth, looking for which symmetrical side looks as close as possible to the movie reference. Under the image tab again, I can select the image file and click reload to bring in the updated symmetrical changes. Returning to the image button, notice we can affect the transparency of these images so that they don't compete with the polylines that we'll be drawing next. Under the Draw Curve tab, I've selected Freeform and Through Points. With those options selected, I'm going to begin tracing in the side view and creating a profile, giving myself some contour lines that we can work with to create the 3D shape. Here I've selected the Circle tool and I'm offsetting. None of this has to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. Nothing is perfect, but we want to set ourselves up for success, get the most information possible. I'm going to continue tracing and I'm working from the outside in. This clay model was created by Miles Teves for Marvel Studios. And this was the actual clay sculpt that was used in the design process to, uh, to create the look for Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. Throughout this tutorial series, you're going to see me flashing back and forth between my reference while I'm working. To do that, I'm using a software called Pure Ref. I'll put a link to that in the description. Uh, it's a free software that you can pick up, and it's fantastic because it's just a little floating window, but I can zoom in and out, and you can see all the other reference that I've gathered, and I can just scroll in and zoom in and zoom out and pan around. It's a large uh, canvas you can just drag and drop and save images to. And at any time I can pull this up, I can lock it to be on top of all the other software that I'm using so the reference is always present. Super handy. So here's more shots of the work that Miles Teves posted for the clay sculpt that he created. And I'm using the clay sculpt because there's a lot of clarity in the form changes. Very, very distinct, very simplified. Uh, consistent material because it is out of clay. So there's a lot that we can understand by just looking at it. As I'm drawing these poly lines, you'll notice that I get these little white grips that pop up. I'm clicking on the show points button on the right hand toolbar. After you draw the curve, you can select it, click the show points button, the grips pop up and you can make more refinements to the curve. When you really start to examine the subtle changes and detailing inside this model, you can see that there are differences in the final movie asset compared to the clay version because the whole design is a process. And as that design changes hands and changes media types, moving from a physical form to a digital, the methods used to create it are different and that will influence the outcome. And that's a nice important point to make because if you're tackling this project, alongside this tutorial and you're going to make this helmet yourself uh remind yourself that it's okay not to be perfect that there actually is no perfect standard out there the digital asset for the film is different than the clay model which is different than the conceptual sketches which is different than all of the conceptual 3d models that were made throughout the whole design process 
Plus, the Iron Man suit itself changes throughout the movies. So if you feel that pressure while you're making this, or you're trying to learn and feeling the frustration of, man, I just can't get it right, hopefully that can help you relax a little bit, uh, especially if you're really trying to nail this. Pay attention to where I'm creating these polylines. I'm tracing the outside silhouette of the object. I'm also tracing anywhere there is a separate piece. Where there's like a cut line, you can see there's a separate metal portion of the helmet. And I'm also placing contour lines. So I'm placing poly lines where there is a sharp change in the form. Examples of those form changes are along the cheekbone as it dives down to the mouthpiece. That's all one piece, but there's a major uh, change in 3D there. So I'm going to put give myself a guideline to help me nail that correctly. Other examples are along the top of the helmet where like the skull is there is a contour line where the form changes from the top of the skull to the side and so i'm going to give myself a poly line there to help nail that area all right i've highlighted everything in yellow these are the guidelines i'll use for the side view of the helmet all right so now i move to the front elevation and we're using the same process the through point lines for the most part, I'll draw on one side of the model and then mirror to the other side and connect everything up. And that's how we're going to trace out and create a framework that we can work off of. I can tell you when working off of reference like this to try and recreate something as uh, iconic as Iron Man, it's very easy to get caught up in the details and feel like you need to get everything perfect at this stage. And you don't. We're going to be refining this through multiple stages. Just keep in mind everything's a process, and you don't have to. The, fo the focus in your mind is less on perfection of making sure you put this line on the perfect spot on the pixel uh, of the reference, so much as you're getting the angles right, you're getting the curvature right, you're studying this. And the beautiful thing about about working off reference like this and recreating something iconic is you have something to measure your work against you you're actually working on several things at once you're learning the tools and there's no corners that can be cut because you have something to compare it against too and that's going to push you to become a better 3d modeler when it comes to becoming a good designer by doing studies like this where you're recreating something that already has a good design you're going to be baking in in a sense some of those uh, good sensibilities. And what I'm talking about right now is not new. Uh, you go all the way back to the Renaissance and the amazing painters from the past, the amazing sculptors from the past, the beginning of their careers, they spent years in ateliers copying and copying more than probably you or I ever will. In the first few years, that was, they would get a masterpiece from a, from an artist that came before them and their job was to recreate it and then when they did that they were supposed to do it again and again and again copy after copy after copy and that's how you build your craftsmanship that's how you learn your tools that's how you uh learn not just the practical aspects of how the creative tools you will use work but also ingraining a sensibility and a sense of taste into your work so be careful about what you work on and what you study from because it will have an influence on how you develop as an artist and should you want to as a designer and at this point we now have a side view and a front view penciled in so to speak with poly lines and from here now from here the process is going to be using these flat elevations and pulling them out into 3D space, using them as a reference to figure out where in 3D space would that curve land. I've opened up the browser window in the bottom right hand of the corner and under the styles drop down, I am assigning these lines its own layer and I'm calling them guides, giving them a color and you can turn these on and off. And then this will allow me to say copy one of these guidelines and then paste it into a, a different style that I've created at the bottom called 3D construction. So I can copy a guideline, paste it onto 3D construction, and if I need to, I can turn off the guides and just focus on this framework. The goal right now is to take these 2D lines and push and pull them in 3D space to 
to a point that we have a cage, a 3D cage of lines outlining the 3D shape of the helmet. To start out, we're focusing on just the top of the helmet, the top of the head, and you can see that I have those red lines. Those are copied from the blue guidelines, and I moved them up and moved them down just now, so you can see that they are on their own style, their own layer. And as we move forward now, you're going to see how I use the front view and the side view in the bottom left and bottom right of the screen as my reference. And I'll begin moving the red polyline. See in the top view how it's moving out to the right? While well, I'm watching in the front view as I move this out to line it up with the top corner of the eye. I turn on show points. And using the perspective view in the top right, I pick that point so I know which one I'm grabbing, right? And then I look down in the bottom left into my front view, and I use the move command to move that point until it lines up with the blue construction lines that I've created for the front view. That's going to take that poly line that was originally drawn in the side view and move it out in 3D space until it conforms with that front elevation. And then I can compare and look back and forth between the front and the side view and make sure that that line is working in both front and side. And the byproduct of, of that polyline matching both now our front and our side view is that in 3D space, in the perspective view in the top right, we will have a curve that is accurately shaping in 3D space that edge of the top of the helmet. Awesome. Boom shakalaka. Huh? Huh? All right. And we're going to select that front eyebrow ridge right above the eye line. Pick this time from the front view that eyebrow ridge, and I'm going to move it out and snap it on to the center line of the side view. It's not going to be perfect, so I'm going to make some adjustments and snap it down. And again, we're working the same process but from the front view to the side view. So now I turn on the show points and I'm able to grab and snap that edge to the corner of the piece that we just worked on. And the result is we're starting to build a cage for that top of the helmet. And all along, this is a refinement process as I, as I hinted at earlier. So we look at reference, we're comparing the front view, we're comparing the right view, and we're making choices to build out this. 3D wireframe that we're going to construct the surfaces on top of. So you're going to see me pushing and pulling points. Uh, I'm not married to any one particular view because I'm also looking at the reference and I'm just discovering what's going to work and fit the best. This is that part of learning that no one can tell you. It's, it's learned by doing. So the action of you sitting down and going through this uh, kind of battling to learn it for yourself as you follow along. There's a kind of learning that's going to take place that is nonverbal. This is how you become a better artist. It's in these kind of moments now where you're going to check your views, check your reference, and you're going to make small decisions. And don't worry about them being perfect. Don't worry about making mistakes. Uh, just make a decision, move forward with it. And you might find, depending on how experienced you are with 3D modeling, that you might go down a road and say, oh, well, I probably shouldn't have gone that way. It's not working out. I need to go back and work on it again. If you can develop the patience and I suppose kind of work ethic to say, okay, I'll chalk it and I'll go back to where it was working and I'll restart. That's where some real quality learning is going to take place. It's an investment in the future. The next time you sit down to model, uh, you're going to be that much better. So when you're struggling with something, when you feel that you don't understand it or it's not working the way you want, do not treat those feelings or thoughts as a sign that you can't do it. Understand that in those moments, you are in the trenches, you're down in the mud, and every single one of us have felt those things, thought those things, and struggled. Uh, it's not about perfection. It's not about chasing the goal. That's why you will see time and time again, so many of us talk about process, process, process. We almost overuse that word. What we're saying is that pain is real. <laughs> we all go through it. And if you can make the choice to say, hey, I'm learning, I'm not going to be so hard on myself, but I will push myself to try and do better. When you recognize that something's not working out, simply stop, 
rewind a few steps back to where it was feeling good to where you do think you made the right moves and start again from there and move forward. See if you can make some different choices and see how those pan out for you. If you can do that when you get frustrated and keep trying, you will find that you will grow faster than you imagine. All right, while I've been jabbering on, I've constructed this kind of top shell of the skull and I'm going to press network under the construct tab. And that's how we create a shell out of this net network of curves that we've created. And you're going to see me kick this over to key shot and I've got some things to talk about there, but I just want to show you as an example how we're going to make these surfaces. A couple important things to point out. You might find when you're doing this yourself that you will press the network button and you'll get a result that's not as clean as what I'm showing on the screen. If it turns into this weird surface, it's like folding on itself. That means that Moy is trying to interpret the lines that you've created and it can't find a good solution. What you need to do is go back and look at your curves or all the curves connecting and meeting at endpoints. If you have a curve in the center that's helping you create the shape of the surface, is that connecting perfectly onto the other curves? Because if there's a gap there or it's not aligning properly, it's going to try and resolve that gap and it's going to have to make the surface bend to, to, to fill in those gaps. So it makes sense in your mind what you want it to do, but if you're not giving the proper inputs to Moi, it's going to freak out. And like, I, I can't resolve this curve, so I'm going to make it all warbly and weird. So if you get that, you need to go back, clean up your curves. So you don't need Keyshot for any of this modeling. I'm putting it in here just so that I can put this shader on. So as I rotate it, you can see how clean result is. If you know anything about anatomy and the way the skull uh, deforms at the top of the forehead and then scoops back into the top of the head, you'll notice that that's present in this uh, top of the helmet. And that's translated directly through the lines that we pulled off of the clay sculpt. Uh, for me, I, it's, it, it's, it, it's exciting because then you know that you're on the right path. However, on the other side of this render on the back of the skull, you can see where the surface is not as smooth, where it kind of has a divot, a sharp crease. That's because on that back side, the curves that I used were straight lines versus a continuous freeform line. Again, it's a process. So this is not the final model. We're simply building our framework and getting something in 3D that we can work on top of. Here's another quick tip. To avoid pinching at the center of a model, you want to use one continuous curve from the left side to the right side, not two separate ones that meet in the middle. The challenge with one continuous curve is to make it symmetrical. So what you can do is turn on show points and draw a line from that grip point and then mirror that line to the opposite side and grab the grip point of the curve and snap it onto these guidelines that you draw in. And that's a way to ensure that that continuous curve is symmetrical on both sides. As you make adjustments to curves, uh, make sure to check all your views and zoom in and make sure that they're snapped and meeting together. This is an example of one of those gaps where if you leave it, you might get an irregular solution when you try to create a network surface. So this is a short example on the top of the helmet, how we can kind of refine, make changes and improve the integrity of the surfaces that we will create. Next, I'm going to show you another surface using the same processes that we've done to this point. This is for the side of the helmet around the earpiece. And look at, look at some of the flaws in the surface. We have pinching in areas where we don't want it. Uh, we have irregularities. The, the, the quality of the surface is not what we're looking for. But at this stage in the modeling process, that is not as important. So I'm networking these surfaces to show you that you might get some errors like this. Uh, that's okay. This is not the final. Our goal right now, our target is 3D wireframe cage of the entire helmet. To be very clear, I am networking and showing these surfaces right now to illustrate a point for this tutorial. However, I recommend that you build the entire helmet out only in the curves. And that's what you're going to see moving forward in the next step of this tutorial. So, all right, we're zooming, we're zooming. Our 3D modeling skills go burr. Remember to use your reference and work 
predominantly from your front and your side views. Take a line from the front cage and then look in your side view and move it over until it lines up. Turn on show points. Use your perspective view to grab that point that you want to move and then go back to your front and side views and start moving it around until that singular curving line matches up with your guidelines in both your front and side view. And that is how you'll create every three dimensional curving line of the entire helmet. I keep mentioning, look at your reference, look at your reference. Let's take a look at an example of what I mean by that. In a, in a moment, I'm going to pull up a reference of uh, a still from the Iron Man movie. We're looking at the materiality, the way the light reflects off of the metal, especially around the, the eye line, the jaw line down to the mouth. There is a form change at the corner of the eye that is a swooping line down to the mouth. Now I say line, but really it's an implied line, right? Because there is no cut there. It's just a form change. And you can see, looking at the way the light is shaped on the metal, that that curvature moves like a teardrop from the corner of the eye down to the more aggressively cut line around the jaw and mouth area. So when I see something like that in the reference, I think, okay, that's a form change that I don't have indicated in my own contour lines yet, but I want to make sure that I capture it. So even though that was not as prevalent in the clay sculpture, that's something that changed with the modeling. And so I'm going to add that in myself. It's also important that you reference multiple angles and as many types of reference as you can find, because especially when it comes to a fully rendered model, uh, lighting can play tricks. Some things are form changes, but some things are texturing. Some things could fool you a little bit, but if you can verify it from multiple angles, uh, from different renders and different lighting conditions, uh, that's a good way to understand the underlying form versus, you know, say a smudge on the front of the mask that looks like there's a denting of a nose that maybe isn't really there. This tutorial, my goal is different than your goal, right? So my goal is to make it as clear as possible and as succinct as possible, to give you all the best information directly. So it's, if I'm doing my job, it's going to come across this kind of easy. So on your end of this, and I'm speaking now to those who are actually watching the entire tutorial and really committed to becoming a better artist. So you're watching it in real time, you're rewinding parts, you're doing the practice on your own, you're coming back, you're checking it and you're, you're really watching this thing all the way through, um, to those people who are focused on this. If I've done my job in the tutorial to make it look easy, please know that it's not. This stuff is not easy. And here's one of the biggest tips to learning and learning quickly. And it's kind of a contradiction. If you want to learn fast, if you want to become a better modeler quicker, you need to go slow now. And it's like, what? If you go slow now, and pay attention, watch the video on normal speed, go through it, pause it, go practice, come back, try again. That can take so much time, but if you go slow now, you'll actually learn it. And then the next time you go to model something, you're going to notice, oh boy, I'm better. Oh boy, I'm a little faster. That's how you get better. We live in a very strange time right now where there's tons of information coming at us from all different angles. And you know, you, you get excited. You want to learn how to do this thing. You're watching 10 YouTube videos on like 4x speed and you're clicking through them so you can get through that video faster. Boom, 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 boom. And you think you got the information and then your dopamine kicks in in your brain because you completed the video and boom, you know, you feel pretty good and you think you learned something, but you didn't learn shit. Slow down. Sit down, get a cup of tea, and absorb something for a few minutes. Turn off all the other distractions. And, and this is not for everybody. Hey, man, if this is kind of just something going on in the background, if you already know this stuff, you're working on something else, I do that too. This is not a lecture, but I'm here to give you the best information possible in the clearest way possible. So that's why I'm saying this. If you really want to learn this stuff, stop. Turn it to regular speed. I promise you that extra five minutes that you think that you lost from slowing it down to normal speed and just being present and learning 
one thing at a time. If you can learn that, and it's like a superpower these days because nobody can do this. If you can do that, you will retain the information better. You watch the video, you pause it, you practice it. Come back and check it. Do it again. Come back a day later or whenever else you have time to focus on this again. Sit down and do some focused practice. And I am telling you, more than any other tool or technique that I will show you on my entire channel, if you do this thing that I'm telling you right now, you will get better and you will get better faster than anybody watching 10 times the tutorials at 100 times the speed because they're going to get the dopamine kick thinking that they learned something, but it didn't, it didn't sink in. All right. So now that I have lectured like a psychotic person, even though I said it wasn't a lecture, it was pretty much a lecture. This is the goal of where you want to get to by the end of part one of this tutorial. As I spin this around, you can see everything is blocked out in a wire kind of cage form. We've mapped out all our major 3D landmarks, simplified the steps. We're not trying to just snap our fingers or model at one time this complex, awesome design. We've broken it down into an in incremental step, working with 2D and then using that 2D to slowly sneak into 3D. And there's no surfaces yet. There's no actual 3D geometry. It's all 2D splines, but we've got that roadmap now in 3D space that we can connect to, that we can snap to, that we can build off of and a clear path forward. Okay, part two is coming as soon as I can finish the editing. Uh, believe me, I wish I could get these out faster. Maybe one day if this becomes a full-time thing, I'll be able to do that. But I'll be working this weekend to get part two out and I'll see how fast I can do that. We're going to look at surfacing this inside of Moai 3D. And we'll talk about next steps from there. I hope that you get a lot out of this. Take any advice that I give you with a grain of salt. Do what works best for you. Don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, good luck. If you have any questions, leave a comment. Yeah, I'll talk to you guys soon. Part two is coming out as soon as I can get thing done. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.